What's up guys, thanks for joining me today. We're gonna to be talking about batteries, quads, radios and goggles, and just general maintenance of making your quad airworthy according to the FAA. Not necessarily specifically, but just kind of my run rundown on how I keep my aircraft you know, up to par over the lifetime of whatever piece of component or piece of gear that you're talking about. So for example, we'll talk about quads, we'll talk about carbon fiber, the electronics. If I'm gonna go into a quad and try to fix something, what am I gonna check while I'm in there to just make sure this whole thing is airworthy and ready to go and I'm not going to be you know too worried about anything happening midair because oh I didn't check the video transmitting antenna and it was completely disconnected last time I changed an arm so I'll just go into like general idea of keeping these things in the air and just maintaining them and then we'll talk about batteries and the same thing with radio and goggles which don't really have a lot to maintain but again there are things to maintain and I'll just talk about the entire kit since we're here. So the first thing of all, we'll talk about the quad in general. We'll talk about electronics first. So quad electronics, usually if there's something out there that's broken, you'll see it and you'll notice it. Hey, video transmitter doesn't work anymore. Hey, the friggin' video transmitter uh, is touching the ESC and now the ESC doesn't work anymore. Or hey, I had a fire today and you know a motor is burnt. Like you can physically see these things or you can notice that they're not working. Maybe one motor doesn't spin up, then that's going to tell you, hey, an ESC is probably broken or there's a firmware problem or maybe a, just a boot up situation where it didn't boot up completely right. So there's a lot of things that you can narrow down very quickly. Um, and I like to group things into like FPV and then quad stuff. So you have ESC flight controller, uh, RC receiver, and then motors. So those are like your flight control stuff. And then you have video transmitter camera and um, video transmitting antenna and maybe an OSD board. And those are kind of your FPV things. All of those things are split into separate groups and I try to keep them in separate groups. Obviously there are uh, FCs out there that have OSDs on them, but you know, same thing with like a four in one ESC. If one thing goes wrong on that, then everything goes wrong. So it's always a give and take. You can go smaller and lighter and more complex, but when you start getting more complex, then all of a sudden, if you have a problem, then all of that complexity is now dead rather than just one thing. And you're very rarely gonna fix things at a component level. So if you do have a problem like that, say you have a video transmitter and you feel like something's wrong with your OSD, so you're gonna check your camera first, you're gonna plug it into another quad, um, and ideally you would have two of the same quad and I'll talk about that here in a second But if you have uh, a video transmitter or something that may be acting up You can always plug it into something else and test it see if it works like if on a known quantity Hey, this aircraft works the only thing I'm changing is video transmitter Let me plug it into this other one see if it works if it doesn't then it could be the video transmitter if it works Then hey, I'm gonna check the camera. Hey, is the camera working? All right, the camera's working let me check the OSD board and then you can kind of narrow it down that way and then usually you're going to end up just replacing that component. So that's kind of how I would go down uh, a, like a rabbit hole of trying to fix a problem. Um, and like I said a second ago, having two of the same aircraft is very advantageous because not only if you crash one and you need to fly another one, you're not having to relearn how to fly a new aircraft because it's exactly the same as the one you just crashed and you just pick it up because it's like second hand or second nature to you because it's the same aircraft that you fly on a regular basis and that overall just helps you become a better pilot flying the same thing over and over because you just get muscle memory to that particular weight and that particular style of flying um, and it's that, that same aircraft um, but also you can switch components back and forth if you have a problem on one of them and figure out whether or not it's a you know combination problem where you're having it on both of them or you know say one component is going bad on one you can try it on the other and you can make sure that that is exactly what it is so you know what you're going to order when you order new parts so again Electronics, there's always something that uh, you're gonna just know right off the bat, like, hey, this is not working correctly because I have an A and a B to compare it to. Again, two aircraft, they're always gonna be very similar, um, but when something goes wrong, you'll know because the other quad is different. Like, hey, the video is way better on this other quad, why? And then you might start checking connect connections as well. So a huge issue with FPV in general when you crash, um, obviously things are going through a lot of jarring and jolting um, and connections are the first thing that usually break. So if you have a video transmitter connection, say an SMA to UFL or you have a UFL connection for your receiving antenna or you have a plug that goes from your ESC to your flight controller, all of these things are susceptible to being moved and shifted and not making a connection 100% of the time. And those are very easy fixes, but sometimes can be the most hard fixes to find because you're looking for something way bigger than what it actually is. You're like, oh, the video transmitter's broken, but in reality, it's just the SMA connection is slightly loose and you're just not getting the connection that you should. And then that can cause you to have worse video. So just make sure you check all the connections and make sure if you do have a problem that you're just making sure that all of the stuff that you're looking at 
you're not just ruling out the fact that it could be something simple because obviously at the end of the day the simple things are the things that give us the most grief usually because we think we overthink it and just it's just generally harder to find simple problems um, so with that being said electronics you're probably going to replace it if you do have a problem um, and ruling out what you have to replace is kind of like you know figuring out hey this is broken and this is why because i tested it on this thing and it works and it doesn't work on here, so I need to replace whatever, the OSD board, or I need to replace the video transmitter. So that's kind of how I go about it. Um, and again, those are like things that you'll see right off the bat, or you'll know it's not working. One motor's not spinning up, video's not working, AKA uh, a big problem where you can't fly. Now, when you're talking about small things like carbon fiber, or maybe a chopped antenna, and you're not getting the best in, best range, these things can be a little bit more subtle. So if you were to chop a receiving antenna or just the ground plane of a receiving antenna, you might not actually know, notice a difference in range until you get out super far, which is that you're like, oh, I usually go this far and it's fine. And then you fly and you have a problem. So you kind of want to make sure that you're checking your antennas to just make sure that they're okay. They do protrude from the aircraft, so they're a little bit more subject to getting chopped by the props. So again, just make sure that you're looking at antennas before you do anything, or especially when you're going through a quad and fixing something, you're just kind of making sure everything looks good. And there's no specific science about it. I'm just like going over and looking at the quad and saying, hey, that looks good. Oh, that solder joint looks crappy. It looks like it's about to break off. Let me fix that. Um, it's, it's just generally looking at it. And there's really not that much in there to look at. So you're just you know, checking things out. Um, motors, you're probably going to see or hear a problem. If you have a motor that's causing an issue, it's probably going to make an audible noise when you're flying it. So you're going to hear a vibration in the, in the flight control. You're going to hear the quad vibrating. And then, or you're going to hear some rubbing when you turn the motor. Um, all of these things can obviously be seen and heard very easily. Um, but again, if you have like a physical dent on a motor, but it's not rubbing or doing anything weird or causing any kind of weird flight characteristics with the aircraft, then there's not really any need to change it. And I don't necessarily think unless you're just super anal about how your quad looks, that you should change that motor. I, I mean, I fly with motors with giant dents in them all the time and they fly fine. Like the flight controller can handle it. It's not really going to be that big of a deal. Um, but if it is causing a problem and it is rubbing, then that can cause excess heat which in turn can you know put stress on your flight controller and your ESC just because of the heat buildup, the ESC, and then under the flight controller. And then it can also stress that motor out and it stress the opposing motor out. So you might end up burning some windings on the opposing motor of the one that's sticking because it's having to compensate for that motor that's weak on that one side. So again, motors, you're probably going to hear it or notice it. Uh, and, if, and obviously props are a big thing as well. If you have a prop that's bent, you should probably check the tracking of the prop and make sure it's spinning straight. If you're gonna be bending them back, then you need to make sure that's uh, the case all the time where you're like checking these props and making sure they're straight because if they're not, that can cause a motor to heat up and cause problems. Um, just change props if you have any doubts. If you're having doubts, you have some kind of problem, put new props on there and it's probably gonna fix the problem. Next thing is carbon fiber. Um, carbon fiber in general, you can physically see it being broken. Um, if it's broken, like say for instance, this arm right here, the tip of this arm is broken. I didn't really have a reason to change it other than the fact that the tip of it was broken and it wasn't protecting motors as well. So when you have a little bit of protrusion in the arm right here, you're getting a little bit more motor protection. With this particular one, I was ending up, I ended up denting two bells that day because this arm had this uh, missing piece. Now this arm is still good. Like I could put this on a quad and fly it and it would be perfectly fine. Now this arm for instance actually has the the tip still on it but it's delaminated down the center and how I noticed that was I you know obviously heard something in the quad like why is that making that noise and it's usually like a high vibration a high frequency noise um, and then what you do to check that is you just grab the quad like this and start trying to twist the arms laterally and if they twist any more than like five degrees then i think five degrees is a lot probably less than that but five to ten degrees if something's twisting that much like i'm putting a lot of fours in here and it's not twisting at all i'm sure someone stronger than me can make these things twist but again if you're getting more flex than the other side then probably that arm is delaminated down the center and you should replace that arm and it's probably going to fix your problems um yeah so carbon fiber pretty self-explanatory you got a broken bottom plate broken top plate you can see it physically you can be like oh well that's broken let me change that um, you don't necessarily need to like a top plate being broken isn't going to affect the flight characteristics a bottom plate being broken isn't going to affect the flight characteristics but an arm definitely will affect the flight characteristics and if you have a GoPro mounted to the top plate and you have a top plate that's broken the GoPro is more likely to eject if you have a top plate broken so again all these pieces being uh, like they should be and not broken is going to help the aircraft overall 
but it's not necessarily a huge thing. If you got a top plate that's broken and you just want to fly that day, cool, go out and fly until the new one comes in, whatever. It's not that big of a deal. So that's kind of my general rule of thumb with quads. I like having two quads that are identical, especially because you can swap components out. If you crash in the field, you can be like, oh, well, this one's broken, but that one needs a motor. Oh, well, take one from here and swap it on there, and then I'm good to go, and it's easy. Um, the other thing is, is when you're making sure that aircrafts um, are airworthy or you're testing them out, you can A-B them. Say this one works this way, this one isn't working, what's the problem? Um, having the same identical aircraft does help a lot when you're trying to troubleshoot problems. Uh, and it also just seems to be the magic number. If you have more than two, then you're always going to neglect one. Um, when you have two, you're like obligated to fix one when you break it because you know that you're on your backup and you're like, it's just, it's just nice. Two is the, the magic number for me. I've had like five at a time and I never fly them. I'm just like, oh, that one's broken. Fuck it. I'll just leave it on the side of the road, whatever. Not really, but I just don't fly it and I'll fix it like a week later where when I have two, I'm like, I got to fix it tonight because I'm going out flying tomorrow and I need to have two quads. So now let's talk about radios and goggles. So radio and goggles, not really much to be said uh, other than firmware. So with a radio, talking about firmwares, I'm on some beta build, nightly build thing. Uh, not really that big of a deal on the OpenTX firmware. Oh my God, it's so loud. Um, I don't really care what firmware is on here. The thing that I'm worried about is the Crossfire firmware. And I just run whatever the latest beta is. I'm not necessarily crazy about the alpha stuff. Um, not, not saying that there are problems with it, but it, beta's fine for me. Uh, if there's something crazy and I need to try it, people are like, you gotta try it, then I'll try an alpha. But usually I'm just running whatever the latest beta is. Now, um, because I'm running some weird nightly build is specifically because I wanted to run Crossfire shot and that's why I'm doing that. And I just haven't updated to whatever because I feel like OpenTX is such a pain in the butt. Once it works, I just let it go and just never touch it until it gives me a problem or something crazy comes out where I have to upgrade. Um, the only other thing with the radio that I would say is make sure your switches are tight. It's nothing worse than having a loose switch. You literally just twist these things and tighten them up. Um, the other thing is making sure this thing is tight. These things swiveling around is such an annoying thing. You got to take the dang radio apart and pull the, the power switch and take an eight mil driver and tighten this thing up. But once it's tight, it's really nice. Um, and it, you know, if you're using a neck strap, it's going to help you a lot. And then the only thing, other thing is this, and this is the throttle gimbal. Obviously, uh, they have detent on them from the factory, which is that, that clicky noise. Um, I always take the detent off, which there's two little uh, rails in there. You can adjust them with a Phillips head screwdriver and you could adjust one down or adjust the other one down. And one of them has detent and one of them has a, a smooth surface. And I usually put some grease in there. I've used olive oil. I've used butter. I've used uh, red and tacky, which is what I'm using now. I've used white lithium grease. All of them wear out over time. I feel like the red and tacky stuff um, works a lot longer because I usually have to replace this lube after about six months or so. Um, but yeah, I just want to keep my throttle gimbal as smooth as possible. And then also these uh, springs are as loose as possible. And I have had springs break, but again, you're talking about springs breaking in a radio that costs 200 bucks. It would be different if it was like a thousand dollar radio and a spring broke, I would be a little bit more upset, but I haven't had a spring break in years. And those were on the stock trans gimbals ever since I've had the, the, these R9s or whatever, whatever this thing is called, the M9s, M8s, I don't know, these stupid Hall Effect gimbals. I haven't had a spring break. So again, a spring break, that's funny. Yeah, so anyways, got my radio there. That's all I really do to it. Goggles, don't really do anything other than keeping my um, my receiver up to date. I try, I like do it every three to six months. I'll check it and make sure it's, you know, at the, the latest firmware. Um, other than that, I just make sure my antennas are good. When I take them off and on all the time, you just wanna check the connections and make sure there's nothing loose or nothing broken. Um, and then shake them occasionally, make sure they're not a baby rattle because if they are, then something's broken internally. You should probably replace it because it's probably giving you shittier video than you actually would have if it wasn't rattling. Um, that's really it with goggles. Now, the last thing with batteries, um, batteries are kind of a weird thing. A lot of people crash them before they actually get the life out of them that they, sh that they think they're going to get. So I'll just give you an example. This particular battery, it's kind of lucky because it was, uh, I usually put the date on the back. This one is 7-4-2018. At the time I was coming from 4S and batteries were lasting me like three to six months. 6S batteries are lasting me years at a time just because there's so much less Amtral and so much less pressure on the battery. Um, so at this time I was running like the date and the month, but now I run the month and the year because obviously they're lasting me a lot longer and I don't really need to be as precise as the day. I can go with months and it's just a little bit better. So this battery was 7 4 2018 um, and it's probably got 200 cycles on it and it works really well still, but it's not as good as a newer battery. Like these are about six, seven, eight, eight months old now um, and 9, 8, 9 19. 
And these batteries have seen a lot more abuse. Like this one's lucky. This one didn't really see any crashes. I mean, it saw crashes, but not hard ones on concrete where both of these batteries have seen pretty hard crashes on concrete. This one's got a big dent in it. And this one's got a nice skid mark on it. Um, I'm just, you know, checking these batteries, checking the cells, making sure there's not anything leaking. You can smell if lithium is leaking out, you can smell like a sweet smell. So just check your batteries and, you know, kind of generally make sure that they look okay. If they're super bent, you probably want to retire that battery or try to bend it back. Um, but usually I find if they're super bent, then they're not really going to come back. And then also just make sure you check the cells and say, Hey, these batteries, all these, all these cells are good. And just periodically, if you have a suspect battery, keep an eye on it for a couple weeks until you know that it's, it's solid. Um, one other thing that I can say about batteries is when you're charging and discharging them, or you go outside and you want to fly and you discharge it too much. Um, the main thing about batteries is you don't want to leave them too charged for too long and you don't want to leave them discharged for too long. And you want to kind of leave them in their storage voltage, which is about 23 volts on a 6S battery. And uh, higher voltage for me, um, charging these things up is 25.2, which is a standard 4.2 volts per cell. And then when I discharge them, I stop at about 22 volts. But occasionally I go down to like 19 just because I'm somewhere and I can't get back in time or I'm having too much fun and I don't look at my uh, OSD and I don't know what voltage I'm at. So all of those things can play into it. But if you do discharge a battery down to like 19 volts, you pretty much want to charge it ASAP. As soon as you get home, you want to put it back up to uh, your storage voltage. And I've had batteries like this. These are seven, eight months old. I would still consider these like 99 or 95% power. Like I haven't really noticed. I'm sure if I put a brand new battery on and flew it a couple cycles, I would be like, oh yeah, that battery is probably a little better, but these are perfectly adequate. And I've had these for like six or seven months now. Um, probably, I don't even know. I can't math right now, but yeah, these things have had a hundred, a hundred cycles or more and they're good. And they've been abused pretty hard. This one, 200 cycles. I can definitely tell you that this one is lacking on power, but it's probably just because I left it at whatever storage voltage or, or not storage voltage, discharge voltage or too much voltage for a long period of time, which I was a little bit less adamant about my battery because um, I didn't think they would last that long. So it's like, ah, oh, whatever, I don't need to. But with 6S, I find that these batteries last so long that you really need to be adamant about making sure that you take care of them. Um, and yeah, as far as that's concerned, just take care of your batteries. And if you're crashing them on a regular basis, then whatever and you're breaking them, then cool. You're probably going to go through batteries faster crashing them than you are by, you know, actually going through the lifespan of these batteries. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, I know it was a lot of talking, but it's kind of a subject that people have asked me specifically, what are you doing to make sure your aircrafts are airworthy? And uh, I don't know, hopefully that answered your question. If you like videos like this and you want to see more, uh, or you have any questions in particular that you want me to do a video, I just put it in the comment section below and I will do my best to uh, answer it. Thank you guys. Stay safe and uh, yeah, have fun. I'm sorry if I seem uninterested.